Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the city of Nottingham, where today we have a festival of knowledge called Sequel Bits. We would like to thank our sponsors, our premium sponsor, Microsoft, our platinum sponsor, Fusion IO, our gold sponsors, of which there are many, and our silver and bronze sponsors. Today we have the Fusion IO Lounge, where you can find out about your regional user groups, SQL Relay, SQL Saturdays. Please do attend, and there will be a competition for those people who sign up for a user group. General housekeeping. Today we will not have a fire drill. Therefore, if you hear the sound of the bells, it is a proper uh, fire um, alarm. There will be breaks this morning at 10.30 and 11.50, where you can get te uh, teas and coffees in the exhibition hall and various places throughout the building. Lunch will be at one o'clock, and during the lunch, there will be sessions from our sponsors in the uh, various rooms. Please see the agenda for which uh, sessions are available. This afternoon, there will be a break at uh, 10 to four. Post-conference, there are three sessions uh, that will take you to the start of the party at 18.30. This building is a public place, therefore there is no smoking within this building. We do have a prayer room. Please go to the hotel and ask at reception and they will uh, give you a key for the room. To access the Wi-Fi in the building, those are the instructions. You will also find those uh, in the agenda. We do have a guidebook app for those people who wish to use that as well. On your badges, <coughs> you will see a number and a little Lego sign. Throughout today, there will be a draw by Fusion IO at various points and prizes will be tweeted. You, if you don't have Twitter, they will be on the graffiti wall next to the Fusion IO lounge. Tonight, we have a feast, a merriment on the lawns outside. We will be eating the king's boar, and there will be archery competitions for those who are so skilled. We would like to thank Helen Lau for arranging this and for Fusion IO and SQL Century for helping to uh, sponsor and put this together. The sponsor draws, if you visit their stands, will be taking place at quarter past five. If you need additional drink tokens to make tonight extremely merry, you can gain those from the sponsors if you visit them. Finally, the whole reason why we arrange SQL bits and put on this show is to make uh, for you, is for your enjoyment. Please feast on the knowledge that we partake today and on the festival that we have tonight. I would now like to welcome Connor Cunningham, SQL Server Architect, who will give you your keynote today. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me in the back? Yes? Great. Uh, I'm Connor Cunningham. Some of you may have seen me. I've been here a couple times at SQL Bits. It's always a great opportunity to come and speak to you here. And I, I love to come visit because you have really interesting energy here. As you see, I, I can't say that any of the other conferences I have, uh, I've ever been introduced by Robin Hood. <laughs> uh, a few minor things that I was asked to talk about this morning before we get into the keynote. Um, I'd like to recognize a couple of people 
who recently got some certifications from Microsoft. There's a Microsoft Certified Master and a Microsoft Certified Architect certification, which is some of the techniques that we use to help uh, recognize the individuals who have gone through the certification and training necessary to sort of do the top echelon work for consulting or deployment of our solutions. Uh, the people who got them uh, recently here are listed here, James, Paul, Justin, Ben, and Gavin. Are any of you here today? If so, uh, stand up, we can recognize you guys. Come on. So we have a gift for you. Please go find Chris at the Microsoft booth and you'll get one. Thank you. Okay, and with that, I will get into today's uh, discussion. So one of the things I've been doing for the past year or so uh, is what you would call a Windows Azure SQL Database or, or SQL Azure. I'll call it SQL Azure today because I get really tired saying Windows Azure SQL Database all the time. But uh, I'm going to do a talk on some of the things that I've learned working on building very large scale services for the past few years, which is one of the topics of my job. I, I basically spend a lot of time on this uh, because they tell me to, it's the job, but in addition to that, it's actually quite fun because there's some things that are always new and different. And as someone who spent a lot of time working on building SQL Server solutions, it's been fascinating for me to kind of walk back and see what parts of the way that you do this in SQL Azure are the same and what parts are different. So this talk is largely about that. So an introduction for those of you who haven't seen any of my talks before. Uh, I'm an architect on the SQL team and, and that uh, basically means you go do whatever, doesn't really matter what it is if it's a problem. Sometimes I work on business models, sometimes I work on technical stuff, sometimes I work on test cases. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. Jo it's like a joker in a deck of cards. Uh, and maybe I should be wearing one of the hats actually. Uh, ultimately, the time that I spent at Microsoft has all been in databases. I spent originally time working on, on the Jet Engine, which is what you guys would call Microsoft Access. And later I worked on the Query Optimizer for many years in SQL. And of late, uh, I've been serving more of a breadth architect role. So I work on whatever, disaster recovery solutions, compliance, uh, large scale solutions, you name it. So it just depends a lot on what's happening right now at, at work. So one of the reasons I come to SQL Bits is that I really enjoy talking to you. Uh, I learn so much by coming here to this because the types of things that you're doing with the product are always fascinating. And while we can always kind of predict what might, might come out when we go build a feature and why we might go after something, it's often not possible for us to have um, perfect clairvoyance about what types of solutions you might try to use our product for. And that, knowledge transfer back to me helps me in my job when I go try to figure out well what should I do next in the product because there's always requests for us to do the next big thing and having that calibration from what you guys do here is a great way for me to be able to do my job better. Okay as I mentioned this is a talk about I assume that most of you are oh, let's do a poll how many people here have used SQL Server? <laughs> it's good to start a talk where everyone gets to participate Right? We don't want anyone to feel left out. Um, okay, how many of you have used Windows Azure SQL Database? Right. Not as many. So the idea of this talk is uh, not that you have to be an expert on Windows Azure SQL Database to be able to listen to it. In fact, it's, it's quite the opposite. I want to give an introduction to how I think about the differences between the two based on my experience having played with them. So if you have some expertise in SQL Server, which funnily enough, most of you do, uh, now you'll get a chance to learn a little bit about this. Now I'm not going to go show you go code this way or that way. It's really more how do you think about solving problems, especially at scale in this. So my job as architect is often to go sit in a room, they explain some very technical thing to me, and then I just ask the question why, and then they fall over, and then we have to start over because they didn't actually have any idea what they were doing. This is the way that you can not have that happen to you when you start playing with SQL Azure. I want to demystify it a little bit so that when you go play with this in the future, you'll have an opportunity to have some grounding about some of the, west, the, the wisdom that we've had to learn the hard way uh, with some of our earlier customers. So when you look at Windows, uh, Windows Azure SQL Database, SQL Azure, and you look at SQL Server, at the smallest level, they're pretty much the same thing. There's a database. Uh, one has an instance where you have databases, and the other is just a database or a bunch of databases that are each separate. But as long as your solution is pretty small and you fit within one database, things actually kind of look mostly the same. The differences happen when you start trying to scale each of them. In regular SQL Server, you end up getting bigger and bigger machines. In SQL Azure, you really can't do that. And so the techniques that you use actually are radically different. So 
it's kind of nice, I can go give you a, you know, a talk on how do you build a solution or whatever, but I actually kind of be find, find it to be more fun talking about all the big things that go wrong whenever you build a massive solution. So I'm going to give you an introduction to Windows Azure SQL Database from the lens of someone trying to build the largest possible solution. And the solace I'll give you is that every solution that you'll probably try to build should be mostly easier than the ones that I end up having to do. But uh, so don't feel that this is too scary to start. I just want to make sure that you have a nice counterpoint to how you might do it in SQL Server. And as a fair warning, I gave this talk earlier to a, a group of junior engineers within Microsoft who had never worked on SQL Azure, and they, they sort of, I had to stop in the middle and explain, and this is not a joke, I'm actually giving this talk, and it's not that I'm, I'm telling you all of these things because I'm making it up. This is actually how you do it. And the way that I was telling the engineering team about this was that there are many things that are not completely done yet in SQL Azure. We're still building this thing as we go. SQL Server will do three, three years of uh, work and then we'll release something to you and it's mostly ready for prime time. In the case of SQL Azure, we have something that works, but it doesn't work for every single possible use case that SQL Server has. The two are just at different points in their development. So you should have the right frame of mind when looking at this. This is not a complete solution where every single possible thing you can do on the platform is done today. And I'm not gonna pretend that to you, but there are a class of things that you can do. And one of the typical first things I hear from people who are trying to go from SQL Server to SQL Azure is, hey, how do I, how do I get this to work? I can only, you know, it's small, I can only have one database, blah, blah, blah. And, and then eventually they get to the point where they realize that actually they're asking the wrong questions. So I want to set this up to make sure that you understand that the things that I'm doing as best practices for the most extreme cases today are not what every single person has to do. And furthermore, over time, Microsoft obviously will be make, working to make some of these things easier to do. The very motivated people at the edge were really interesting to me. And they were doing stuff that was so far afield from what traditional SQL Server was doing that I wanted to do a talk on that because I thought that would be the most interesting way for people to learn about what you can do with the platform today, especially at scale. And ultimately what I've learned is I can build things that scale to internet size using SQL Azure as long as I think about it the right way. And you wouldn't think that you could do that with something that only supports a 150 gigabyte database on commodity hardware. Okay, so it's good to have the right frame as to why you might use SQL Azure, because not everyone is using it yet, and uh, some of the things that are there are different than why you might use regular SQL Server. So when I go talk to customers about why they want to move to the cloud, the typical answers I get boil down to a couple of main areas. One of those areas is, hey, I can get a database whenever I want. It's really nice. How many people here have ever tried to deploy a SQL Server installation where you had to go acquire the hardware? Right, some set of you. How many of you got that in less than two months? Not as many, right? So with SQL Azure, you can go give a credit card, and then all of a sudden, five minutes later, you can have a database. And for those of you who have ever had to go through a procurement process and been told no, or we don't have budget, or you have to wait till next fiscal year, none of that stuff exists here. I mean, maybe you still have to talk to your people and get some money, I guess, but at the end of the day, the notion of the friction associated with getting the IT department to approve getting new hardware online is changed radically in this model. You can just create databases whenever you want. The next thing that I hear from customers about what they like about the platform boils down to, hey, there's a bunch of stuff that you've just configured for us. It seems kind of nice. I don't have to go do all that work anymore. You take backups automatically. You uh, set up the high availability stuff for us, that's pretty nice, and then you do patching for us. And, and often those are the things that aren't any fun for a lot of the companies that are working on our, our platform, right? They want to go work on their solution instead of work on administering the platform. So figuring out how to make that easy for customers became a priority for us, and we came up with a number of techniques to help figure out, well, how do you get rid of the boring parts so that people can work on the exciting parts of their business? And this automatic baked-in configuration was, was a part of that. And the last bit that came out of this was that w if you can build something that's actually a service that's available pretty much 24-7, you can just go to it, and we're constantly working to improve it, that seems to be another compelling interest in the model that, that's different than a traditional SQL Server today. So a number of customers are very excited about that because they want to be able to go to, to one vendor and just say, look, I have this problem, I'd like a database, will you help me solve that? And Microsoft, last I checked, was in the database business, so we said, well, maybe we should do that. That seems pretty good. So this doesn't mean that every single thing works today and that every single customer has to want this today. 
right? It's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with continuing to use SQL Server. I'm not here to try to sell you to move all of your applications. But if these are the things that are causing you to think about what you do with your IT spending, then this is what you can do in SQL Azure today. So now let's go one level deeper and figure out what does it mean if you actually do want to use this and, and how does that change how you think about the architecture for building your application. The first of those is whenever I go um, use a SQL Azure system, the actual hardware that we're buying is not the same as what you might have for each individual SQL Server installation. If you go do capacity planning for SQL Server, you'll actually go buy whatever size machine you need for your peak load. Right? We're not going to know what your peak load is up front, so what we're actually doing is buying a whole pile of the same machine. Every single one of them is a commodity box. It's not a huge machine. It's only got a certain number of cores. It's not the biggest machine you can buy. And so this means that if you have a single database that keeps growing in your regular SQL Server installation, eventually you might get to the point where you have to replace that server with a bigger server. And that's not the way SQL Azure will work. SQL Azure is not, I mean, we will buy newer hardware, and hardware will get better over time, but that's not because you're solution is going to drive us to buy new clusters of machines. What's going to happen is you're eventually going to hit that limit for one machine and then you're going to be stuck. So you have to think a little differently about how do you end up using lots of machines because we have a whole bunch of them instead of one big machine. So this is a scale out approach, not a scale up approach. I've mentioned the fact that the hardware is commodity. That sort of means two things. One, we're trying to maximize price performance so that we can pass that savings on to you and make sure that you have a great deal on a database. The entry point for a SQL Azure database is $5 a month. And I asked my friend uh, Ewan, who works on the SQL Cat team, is that really how they describe it in the UK? It seems that I shouldn't come here and talk about the US dollar. It's imperialistic and all that. I should, no, no. What, do they actually, meant, you know, then the, the portal actually listed as $5 a month in the, in the little currency converter. I was, I was aghast at this. So this is actually a new bug for me to go back and work on with the team, because I want it to be in pounds. If I'm going to come here, <laughs> pounds. So the next piece you need to know is that that hardware will fail, right? Machines fail, and as soon as you have lots of hard drives or lots of machines, one of them will be dying all the time. So we've built logic to kind of automatically swap in different commodity machines for you so that you can have a highly available set of compute power whenever you need it. And all that logic took some time to build, but all of your databases just kind of automatically get placed on machines rather than you have one machine and if it dies, you have to go get parts. So that's part of that service aspect. The automatic logic for backups I mentioned before, we take care of that every five minutes. If you have an active database, we're taking backups for you. So that way, if there's ever a problem, you can go back and get that backup. Right now, that's not automated. You have to ask us to give it to you, but over time, it'll become more automated. The next thing that you have to keep in mind is if you do have a $5 database, uh, that's obviously less than the cost of a server. So therefore, multiple people will be sharing that machine. And that'll lead to some differences from how you might think about a regular SQL Server installation on your own dedicated hardware. Getting an actual dedicated machine would be a lot more money. So $5 database is a great entry point, but it means that you have to deal with some nuances such as performance variance that can happen because other people can be busy on the machine. And over time, we're working to make sure that performance variance is more defined and less uh, difficult than it might be right now. But over time, we've been working on improving that and we'll keep doing so. But you'll need to think about that when you design an application on this platform compared to what you might otherwise do. And the last piece is that if you think about uh, being able to create a database whenever you want, that's a very powerful concept. The next question you might ask is, well, how many can I create at a time? Right, can I create one? Can I create 10? You can create 1,000 for all we care. There's obviously some limits at a point where we'll actually ask you to talk to us if you have a very large number of databases you want to create. But this is something where once you start thinking about it in a scale out term, then you can actually create a very large solution as long as you think in terms of database count rather than database size. So the next thing that you need to understand about how Azure works uh, is that when you have regular SQL Server, you would just buy whatever storage array you wanted and shove it in there because you pay for the license once up front. It didn't really matter. In SQL Azure, you're paying by the month. And there's actually two different t tiers for pricing of storage. There's what uh, we call blob storage or table storage, which is really more like a file system storage. And that is relatively cheap. And it's optimized for certain, certain things, but it's not a fully transactional, queryable thing. And then there's actually relational storage, 
<coughs> SQL Azure, which is a higher price point, but it has a lot of stuff baked in automatically for you. So this means that in some cases, the early adopters of the platforms have tried to do two things, to work around the fact that we have a limit on database size of 150 gigabytes per database. They end up taking that uh, data, which might not necessarily be transactional, and pulling it out of their database. <laughs> if you have a document storage database, the documents themselves, you can either store in a file system or you can store in file stream or inside the database as a blob. And you may choose to not store those as blobs in some cases if it would be cheaper for you to store it outside. In other cases, uh, you might find pictures or other things that you don't need transactions around. You'll go pull that into blob storage. So this, this tends to be one of the, the differences. The customers don't necessarily use the SQL Azure database for every single thing. Additionally, if you have, uh, some customers have built logging systems that just log to SQL because it was easy. And in this model, you might find that it's just easier and cheaper and faster to actually log that to table storage. So you need to think about your workload a little bit to understand which one might fit. <coughs> Okay, how many people have heard of an ISV, independent software vendor? Yes, okay, uh, this is a company that sells a solution on top of, a, of another company like SQL Server. So we have a very healthy ecosystem of ISVs and I wanted to talk a little bit about how these get built because often the largest solutions that get built on SQL Azure are ISV solutions that have been switched over to the cloud. So I wanted to make sure everyone had a basis for what, what that means. So the typical pattern, if I can grossly oversimplify, is that you have a database, you sell a copy of SQL Server, it gets put on a machine, and then you also have uh, an app, which is another piece of code that gets sold by this ISV software vendor. And it can be anything. It could be something that keeps track of your uh, you know, cars, or, or if you have an insurance company, anything that wants to, you want to track of, a bank, any of these software packages that you sell, <coughs> They would just run on top of SQL Server, and any of them based on that would have some piece of software they sell. And the way the company makes money is they would typically sell you a copy of their software and maybe a copy of our software, and you'd go put those on two machines, and then you make money by actually just having lots of those get sold. Each one of those is independent. They don't know anything about each other. They're on completely different machines. So that's your business strategy. Now, in the cloud world, this actually gets changed a little bit. So you can, you can keep selling software the way you did, right? You can sell VMs and have individual ones for each customer, and there's nothing wrong with that, and we do have some customers that do that. But a number of them have said, you know what, I don't actually have to spin up VMs for every single one of those things. Instead, what I can do is actually just have one layer that runs my app tier, and I can share it across all the different customers that are there. I'll make it a service, and it'll just have an endpoint on the internet, a web page or something you can go to. So if you go to your bank or credit union or whatever, then you can have this uh, just be the website with all the application code behind it to go check your accounts. And then maybe you store each individual's data in one database, like before. And then the way you make more money in this case is you don't necessarily have to spin up an additional VM for each new customer you have. And instead, you might just have a new database or a new database for every set of customers. So this service model has some differences in terms of how much money you'd have to pay to run this. And you make money by just adding more customers. And your goal is to add an infinite number of customers, well, however many there are in the world, 7 billion, whatever. OK, so now let's design something that actually scales on this. I'd love to be able to get my original database application that worked on one database to work across multiple databases so that I can get it spread across multiple machines. And furthermore, I want to be able to make that load go up and down over time. <coughs> I'd love to be able to just spread out and use the clusters of machines, uh, use these $5 databases to be able to solve some problem. Can we do it? Eh? Probably, I'm doing a talk on it, but <laughs> yes, I have done it. I'm going to teach you how to do it. OK. So just in case you guys can't see this here, I took a picture of a typical OLTP schema, customer order order details, uh, the normal Northwind schema, and I put part of it here on the screen. And this would be how I would do this on normal SQL Server. I create three tables, I might join them together, everything works, but I have all the customers in one table, all the orders in one table, all the details to all the orders in another table. Very nice, organized, schema, relational, everything works. We're all very happy with this, right? Everyone's seen Northwind. 
Uh, SQL Azure today mostly focuses on OLTP workloads like Northwind. Doesn't mean you can't do other things with it, but in terms of where the focus is in the price points and the feature sets, it tends to work best in this workload right now. So if you want to do data warehousing in SQL Azure, there are some people who are able to do certain kinds of data warehousing or ETL on it, so I, I don't wish to leave you out. But this talk today will be mostly on OLTP workloads, since that's the primary area where most of these SaaS ISVs are playing right now. If you want to chat about other scenarios, I can talk to you afterwards. But overall, uh, this, is, this is the rest of the talk. So if you have something here and you want to go add an order, you just go write your queries and you have a stored procedure that goes and inserts things. And if you want to do a report, say how many people have bought things this month, you can just run the queries as well on this and everything works great. Of course, the challenge is if this thing gets really, really big, what happens? Eventually, you have more than 150 gigabytes of space and the whole thing just kind of breaks. So what should we do? Okay, you guys don't feel comfortable in a keynote talking back and forth to me, it's okay. But let's split it into multiple databases. So instead of thinking about one big customer table, one big order table, one big order detail table, let's instead take one customer, their orders, and their order details, and keep them together. We'll give it a name, we'll call it a shardlet. And then we'll take another customer of their order order details and we'll have all of those guys be separate. And we'll only run store procedures that touch a given customer, its orders and order details. We won't do ones that cross. And then we can take each shardlet and we'll put them in different databases. Sometimes we can group them together if we want, but we won't think about them being in the same database. We'll only think about shardlets, even if we happen to store multiple shardlets in one database. I'll let this one sink in for a minute and then we'll move on. Everyone get this? It's actually pretty key. Okay, so just in case uh, from, from a vocabulary standpoint, I'm calling the little slices shardlets. I'm calling the databases shards or databases. They're, I'll use the terms interchangeably. And the implication of this is that if you want to do that report at the end of the month, it doesn't work. At least not, not with a query. Okay, the second implication of this is those different databases get spread across the cluster. So if I have 100 databases, I can get that on maybe 100 different machines. So now let's go build an internet facing web service or eBay or Amazon or whatever sales site you prefer. If I want to go add more customers, all I have to do is create a new database and start putting shardlets in it and make sure that I can get them whenever I want to place an order. Right? I don't care about any of the other customers that are there, and I can always make sure that every database is less than 150 gigabytes. And I can just keep doing that as long as I need to to adjust for load. <laughs> so I've now solved the problem of if my machine gets too big, I have to buy a new server. You don't have to care. We've abstracted the machines away, and you don't even know how many machines there are. We'll just keep adding new ones as long as you guys keep creating databases. You excited yet? Yeah, it's good. Okay. Given that SQL Azure is pretty early, there are some people who got very um, enthusiastic about doing this, and then this is why I started having to go work with them, because it was actually quite interesting how quickly they realized they could go do this. Okay, so the problem of having a thousand databases is keeping track of a thousand databases and then finding out where the customer is, right? So now you need another way to solve this and the answer is always another database. <laughs> you guys are great. My retirement thanks you. Um, so the best part about databases is they can solve almost any problem. Uh, you can go put the data of, you know, okay, this customer is in this database and just have it in one single new database directory that you put at the top. And now all of a sudden you can keep track of all the different customers that are buying stuff on your site. And you just need to make sure that that database doesn't fill up too much. And if it does, you can even shard the directory database and have, you know, A through M in one database and N through Z in another database. There's all sorts of ways you can keep, keep scaling out. The same technique works over and over again. Now the way that you eventually build your SAS ISV to do uh, any old OLTP operation is, first you have to go find where the guy is in the directory, and then you have to go connect to the actual 
shard where they live, and then you can run your OLTP operation that just looks at the shardlet. But that part there is just like what you would have done on regular SQL Server. And all of these things are just queries. The only thing you have to have is this pattern about how do you talk to the different databases. And that, some people actually have done this on regular SQL Server. This is not a unique pattern to SQL Azure. But you, have, you pretty much have to use this earlier on SQL Azure because the database size is smaller. Okay. One thing that you kind of realize is, let's say that uh, one shard gets really full. Can I move customers around? And the answer is, yeah, it's, it's just copy some data around and delete it out of the other database, and all of a sudden, you've got a load balancing solution. So you can make sure that if the load on one database gets too hot, or if the size gets too big, then you can typically adjust load, as long as each tenant's data, each shardlet, is less than the size of one database. Okay, so let's do a report query. Uh, the answer is you actually write a program. You don't run a query today. But you can go do show me the sum of all the sales that happened across all of my customers in the month of March. What you end up doing is writing that query against each individual shard, collecting all that together somewhere and putting it in another database. Excellent, you guys are getting this. And then um, you run another query on top of that to sort of aggregate them together. In traditional SQL Server, we have uh, parallel queries, and there's this thing called local global aggregation, where on some threads we can go push aggregations down and run them locally to the data. And, we, and on Numa machines, we can run it really fast in the nice tight memory that's there. Same concept is actually working here in a distributed model, where you say, I want to be able to take my query, split my aggregate into sum up all the things locally within a shard, and then sum up things across all the results of all the shards. So we're just doing that by hand here. Now, it's important to understand uh, transactions a bit. How many of you have put no lock on one of your reports? It's okay. I'm not going to throw anything at you. I'm actually more worried about you throwing things at me. There's more of you. Um, so the reason you put no lock on the reports is because you were getting locking and it seemed bad and we didn't like that and we didn't know why it was happening and the boss was yelling at you and you just want the thing to work, right? But what you really were doing was sort of turning off actually a key piece of concurrency control that we have in SQL Server. And often that might be okay, but it means that your report might not be fully transactionally consistent. But you did it, right? Now, that doesn't make it right or wrong. It just means I wanted to make sure we were all upfront about what we were doing. Because that's what you do here right now as well. Because there's no distributed transaction coordinator today in SQL Azure. Later in the talk, I'm going to discuss some of the techniques that you can use to get consistency in different forms. But it's important to understand that if you need consistency in your application, you should be thinking about what that is. And often, not every single one of our customers has that background to kind of get a sense of what is the consistency that they need and how do they make that work well for their application. Often for a report, if you're not querying the most recent data and you know you're not updating any sales from March, since it's May, then you can just go query it and you don't care because the data is static. But you need to understand that about your application in order to use that technique. You can't just go turn it off because it was blocking. So this puts a little bit more onus on the customer to build a large scale solution versus what you might do in a traditional SQL Server, where the onus was still on you and often you were just putting no lock on things to get your boss to not yell at you. Um, one last detail. If I have lots and lots and lots of databases, this can take a really long time to run. And the largest systems I have today can take hours to run these queries. So it's a very big query in the sense that you can, you can make this work, but you have to want to do it. So you may not do this for every single thing in an ad hoc fashion, given that you have to write a program to go do it. Additionally, uh, the really motivated customers will do like parallel crawls or divide and conquer algorithms on this, but the most simple algorithm is just to do one at a time and collect them. Obviously, that one would take the longest. You can run them in parallel if you want, though. Okay, I'd like to step back and talk a little bit more about SQL Server and then build up to some new concepts as we try to scale these applications now that we kind of have the rough pattern that we need. So, how many of you have, have ever actually tried to create as many sessions as you can, connections as you can against a, a regular SQL server? Yeah, there's a couple of Thomases here, yeah. Um, so you can get 32,000 connections in, because there's this session ID, and that's the size of that, that field in SQL server. And then after that, we, we don't let you create any more. 
in the very high end of regular SQL Server. That's the limit that we have today, and we do have some customers that occasionally hit that with their solutions. And that leads to interesting problems, because if you have more than 32,000 customers at a time, that means that your solution is broken, in much the same way that running out of space on that single SQL Azure box would be broken. <coughs> Not everyone hit that, but it does happen. Now, the actual limit for Windows Azure SQL database, that $5 database, is going to be far less than that 32,000. You're not paying for a whole machine, so we can't give you 32,000 connections. It's going to be a much smaller number. The actual number we have is about 180 right now for how many connections you can have to a single database. But remember, you can create as many databases pretty much as you want, and each of those can have 180. The next piece you need to understand is uh, when you build a service that scales today, on SQL Server, you would typically scale out your app tier or your web tier and you add more and more machines, right? You're scaling out there already. You just weren't scaling out your data tier. So we're gonna actually go try to scale out both now and see what happens. So just to make sure, a little diagram. Here's what you would have done today on regular SQL Server and here's what it would look like now if we try to do the same thing in SQL Azure. Okay, so let's jump one level deeper and actually see what happens underneath the covers. When you have a scale-out service in Windows Azure, uh, let's first talk about, say, a Windows Azure web role. There's this component called the software load balancer. Not to be confused with the load balancer that we have in regular SQL Azure, which does a completely different thing. The one here is a network load balancer. And it'll take and have a network translation between an exposed virtual IP address and an internal direct IP address. And the load balancer will, if you do the configuration of your application and say, I want 10 instances or four instances as I put on this diagram, then what you'd get is uh, the system would create four different VMs for you and then it would have the load balancer route to each of them and it would have a round robin algorithm to sort of distribute the load across all of those as desired. The next thing is whenever you talk between services in Windows Azure or Azure generally, you go back out through the load balancer when you go back, so your virtual IP address is used talking between services. So each service knows about scale out for itself, but doesn't know about scale out across services. Does that make sense? Yes? Okay, very good. So what breaks if I make the number of instances go to infinity? I'll give you a hint, it's that single line in between. Yeah. So if you end up trying to create more and more instances, eventually what will happen is the number of connections you have between any two points and any two services in SQL Azure and Windows Azure today will run out of TCP ports, which is 64,000, excellent. If I had drink tokens, you'd get one. <laughs> It's too early for me to officially give out drink tokens, but you get a star next to your name at least. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I'll see if I can work on the drink tokens. I'm sorry. This is not the best keynote. Uh, I'm working on it. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Thomas. Okay, now the keynote gets interesting and very interactive. Excellent. My kind of party. Okay, so the next thing that we need to talk about is funny stuff that happens when you actually start trying to build SQL solutions on top of scale-out services. So if you have each of those VMs at the top doing ADO.NET connections to SQL Azure, and SQL Azure has scaled out its database tier, and the connection pooling works on the individual connection strings, meaning each individual database will get its own connection pool, and it will cache connections for those. You end up caching connections across all those different VMs. And every time you have a web request come in to say, I want to talk to user Bob, it'll go and route to one of the VMs, cache a connection after opening it, do the work against Bob, and it'll sit there in the cache. And if Bob keeps submitting requests, next request might not go to the same VM. You're going to go cache another connection on a different VM, probabilistically, back to that same database. So after a while, all of those guys have connections cached to talk to Bob. And, and then the same thing's happening against all the other databases that are holding all the other customers. So this is called an N squared interconnect. I can only bother drawing it up to 16 after I get really bored. So you can see that the number of connections is actually growing faster than the number of users that you have on your site. 
And this can radically limit how far you can scale your application. Mentally, the actual picture you want is that you want your compute and your data to be aligned. Sometimes you call this a pod, sometimes it's just partition alignment. If you were to do this in regular SQL Server, we would call this a co-located join, where each section would be joined together by the same thread. But in this case, we just want the logic across tiers to work the same way. So if you use the bottom technique, you can get at least up to the 64,000 TCP limit. If you do the top technique, you can get far, far less than that. So if you're building an interfacing website, you should maybe do the bottom technique. N not that we've hit this problem. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is availability. Um, SQL Azure has an availability SLA of three nines, which means every month, each database on average could be unavailable for about 42 minutes. Sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little less, but the, the statement is 42 minutes. Now, at 42 minutes isn't necessarily when you want it to be. Isn't necessarily when I want it to be, right? It could be when a machine dies. So often, this is uh, the area where customers start to get a little uncomfortable and they squirm in their seats because they haven't actually defined SLAs for their on-premise things in many cases. And if they did, they didn't know really exactly what it is. They may have downtime, and actually maybe that they're down for more than 42 minutes a month for their single system. So you need to think about SLAs, because when you talk to services, that's the only contract that you're going to get, and each service will get you a slightly different contract. And then you have to combine them all to figure out, is my solution going to define an SLA for its customers? So SQL Azure has a series of things to be able to do automatic failover and fix machines and automatically patch. And the way that it does this is by keeping multiple copies of your database and it'll fail over from one to the other whenever it needs to upgrade a machine. And that process of failover should usually take a couple seconds. In the worst cases, it can take a bit longer than that. But overall, what's happening is that patching causes small outages, which is like a regular SQL Server failover. And in some cases, the time to run recovery can be longer than a few seconds. In other cases, it's perfectly fine. But that recovery itself is just like regular SQL Server. And furthermore, the outages aren't going to all come at once. The typical, uh, the exact SLA is this legal thing I'm not going to try to explain today. But usually, we tell customers to try to connect within 30 seconds. And the reason that we do that is we want to sort of hide these failovers from you. So you'll get disconnected more often because the machines are generally multi-tenant and commodity. But if you can write your code to reconnect all the time, then you're going to be able to take advantage of those. Let's talk a bit about the three copies that we keep. So whenever you create a database, we're not creating one database, we're creating three databases. And there's three different copies on three different machines across three different racks in one of our clusters. And the reason for that is that if one of the machines dies, then we still have at least two copies. And we don't actually let you commit any transactions unless we can commit it to a quorum of the copies that we have available. Furthermore, if you are able to go uh, write one of those copies down, the change is automatically pushed to the other changes before we re return from the commit. So that means that if we wanted to fail over, we can fail over at any time without losing data. This is called RPO equals zero whenever you talk about doing high availability disaster recovery solutions. Recovery point objective equals zero minutes means how much time, how, many, how much time could you have exposed of data loss. So this model for HA is slightly different than how you would design a normal HA subsystem for SQL Server. We control it. You don't control it. It's sort of automatic. But it means that certain things work and certain things don't work. This protects you against a single machine failing or a disk failing or something like this. It doesn't protect you against yourself. Right? If you just go delete all of your data, we're going to delete that on all three copies. So don't do that. <laughs> um, it also doesn't protect you by itself if a whole data center gets cut from the internet or a meteorite hits it or terrorists or whatever it is that you might want to protect against. So, that you have to think about when you build your application. So some customers actually want to also have another copy of their database in a different data center, and there's various ways to do that. So you can take backups and move them over. But over time, Microsoft will be in the business of giving you lots of different solutions, just like we do on SQL Server, for how do you build disaster recovery solutions in this world. 
OK, the next thing that comes out that's different is when I go build a multi-tenant system, I have this problem that everyone might try to get busy at exactly the same time on one of the nodes. We have a technology called a, a load balancer, not to be confused with the network load balancer, which actually goes and moves databases across all the machines to try to balance out the load across the cluster. In fact, I was meeting with a team earlier this week that works on that component. And one of the things that that does is help make sure that most of the time you should be such, you know, able to run your, your database and get whatever load you're going to get, but you don't necessarily run the machine ragged. But there are some cases where everyone just gets busy so quickly that the load balancer can't respond quickly enough. And in those cases, we will actually resort to returning errors to the application. So we'll throttle you. And that is a little disconcerting for those of us who are used to single instance machines that we completely own. Uh, now you have to think about that space a little differently. So you have to understand what's the load, what's the rate at which I'm calling SQL Azure, and how do I make sure that I keep things in the right range in order to avoid being throttled. Now sometimes the machine just gets overloaded because of a bug on our, on our side, and we have to go work on improving the service so that that doesn't happen for you. And there are some cases where that still occasionally happens, although we're working very hard on making sure that happens less and less often over time. Um, there's a guide that we have. I'll post my slides. You don't have to write all this down. Whenever we write documents, uh, we can never actually just call it like the perf guide. That'd be too easy. We end up with some big long name that hardly fits on a slide. But the Windows Azure SQL Database Performance and Elasticity Guide is the place where you can go <coughs> learn all the details about throttling and how do you write your code and what codes do you retry. And that's where we will keep up to date all the different details that you need. OK, so if you have a system where a database can be down for 42 minutes a month, you need, the next thing you have to understand is if I have two databases, they might not be down at the same time, right? Because they're not on the same machines necessarily. So as soon as you actually have that problem, the next thing you need to think about is, OK, uh, well, what do, I, what do I do about that? If I have a solution where I need to log into that central directory database once and then log into a user database, that means that both those databases have to be up in order for that call to succeed. So that's not necessarily good because if they're only each available at three nines, the overall availability when you multiply those together is less than three nines. So if you want your website to provide a great experience for your customers, you actually have to think about when is the database going to be available and what do I do when this particular part of my application is not available. The actual solution in this case is to think defensively about how do you program against these services. So when a service becomes unavailable either due to a network hiccup or our database is down due to a failover, how do you go make that work? So for the directory, you actually start caching data. You can say, OK, if the directory is mostly static, I'll keep a cache of that data in my app tiers, and that way I can protect against a small outage in one of my databases. If I have an outage in both my database and the app tier VM that I was using to connect to that, I will actually eventually error, but I can protect against individual failures if I am smart about when I copy data across tiers. So the next thing that you have to understand is, if I build a huge internet-facing web service, oh, no drink token for you. Um, if I build a huge internet-facing web service, I might have thousands of these databases. And that, that's a problem because I'll have things failing all the time, right? Eventually, at 3.9s, something will be failing in my application. And this is sort of disconcerting, right? As engineers, we don't want things to fail. But really, this is all about large-scale systems and what fails and how do they fail. And the rate at which they fail, you know, we can always work on improving, but you have to accept that something will fail at some scale if you're going to be in this business, especially for internet-facing web services. So you have to figure out how do you want it to fail, and what domain do I want to fail. And if I have central points of failure in my application design or my database design, then the whole thing can fall over. If I actually split it up so that each data uh, piece doesn't control the whole system, then all of a sudden I can mean that the thing that fails will only take out, say, users A through C instead of all the users. And by designing defensively, you can actually make sure that the system will give you some amount of protection so that your service provides a greater overall availability if you're going to build on top of a commodity hardware platform.
Okay, so let's talk about some things you have to do in order to build one of these large scale services. So if I have a thousand VMs and a thousand databases and I want to actually understand what's going on, I should just go log into each machine individually and see how it's going, right? No, it, it becomes ridiculous at some scale, right? You can't have enough people to go look at all those services and you can't coordinate all of that. So you need a different approach. Traditional SQL Server would start with, hey, I have these DMVs and I can turn on my ad hoc tracing and I have my perf counters. And these are all the same kinds of data that you actually want to look at. The problem is that most of those techniques are set up with a human going and clicking something to set it up and then manually going and looking at that data individually to determine what's wrong for any given failure. If things are going to be failing pretty much all the time, you don't necessarily want to just do all that manually every single time. You have to think about it from a different perspective in order to get that to scale to this size. The actual technique that most people use is to say, okay, I should collect the data that I need and sort of push that out of the service and start looking at that with automated tools. So you build something to look at the perf counters, you build something to look at the errors, and then you want to figure out what's the most common error in the last half hour, and that's the thing that you go work on, not I want to go look at every single error that comes in. There may be some errors that you're just going to wait because they're not the biggest problem right now. So that technique is a little, it was tough for me as an engineer to do at first, but you have to start thinking a little differently. And the main thing is that when we start to go look at everything, we like to fully understand every problem as engineers. It's great to know exactly why it failed. And I, I love to know why it failed. But the issue isn't that you shouldn't go figure that out. It's how you figure that out and when you figure that out. In the case of an internet facing web service, a SAS ISV, your first concern is actually to get that site working again. Maybe that rebooting that machine is the fastest way to get things working. In regular SQL Server, you might try this. It's not completely out of the ordinary, but you aren't necessarily thinking, oh, I'm going to take the website down or not down. I'm going to go figure out the cause before I fix it often. And you have to separate out, get the site working from figure out the root cause. And what that often means is sometimes you can't figure out the root cause for any individual failure. And what you have to do is go figure out how do I add more logging into my system so that automated mechanism can go figure out next time what happened instead of debug the system and take the site offline, which typically isn't acceptable. There we go. They work now. Okay, so this is a simple telemetry pipeline architecture. We have our Windows Azure SQL database. We have some sort of application tier that's sitting on top of it doing something, and we're generating events and shoving them off somewhere. Usually, we send that to Windows Azure storage, blob storage, or table storage, because the write throughput on those is much higher than a normal SQL Azure database, and it's cheaper as well. So once you have that, you have a dashboard or something that you build on top of that data to sort of visualize it to help you see what's my biggest problem, what should I be working on when I build my application today. What should I work on today? And your goal is every week get better at this. So you start building these systems and the very first time you do it you may just show whatever data you have and then you'll learn, oh I actually need this data and then go do the next rev of your application and you'll get more data through your pipeline. And then you want to build a system that tells you how to prioritize the things that are most important and ignore the things that aren't important and you'll go figure out how to take that and improve the pipeline over time. So this is a continuous thing. It's not something you just get done with and then you're finished. It's actually pretty important. So most people, when they build their apps, they would define their app as, as that. And the rest of it is stuff that people do manually. But the actual mental shift you need to make in order to do these large-scale systems is that that now is your app. I have not seen a successful SAS ISV run without doing this transition. And I spend most of my time now working with them. <coughs> I have some, seen some really bad dashboards, though, I can assure you. Ugly. They don't have to be pretty as long as they work. Okay, next thing that we have is that uh, you can deal with upgrades. And these are important because when you build a large site, you, you can't have downtime. You, you just, you're not allowed to. You're never allowed to take the site down. And that means you can't do maintenance windows or so you don't think at first. What that eventually means is that you have to do something associated with, okay, I need to find a way to make it so I can do online upgrades for every single part of my service, even if I'm doing a major version deployment of my code. I want to change all my schema. I have to be able to support doing online upgrades. Easy, right? It's trivial. It's fun, actually. 
but you have to think very differently about it. The typical problem is if you think in terms of box software, you have this major version, you have all the schema changes, there's all these things you have to change, and then you want to do them all at once, and it might take four hours of downtime to do that. That's actually not really the right way to think about it if you're doing one of these cloud services. What you typically do in this model is say, how do I decompose every service down to the smallest possible thing and then make that work by itself without any downtime or with minimal downtime for each one? So as an example, let's assume that I wanted to add a column to my schema in my database. Okay, how do I do that? Well, I can't just go alt or column. I can, I guess. There's an online alt or column add, you know, alter databases to add a column to your table. Great, you can do that. But if you add it and you actually set a default, then it's a size of data operation. So you can't set a size, can't, actually can't go so, set the data to make sure that you don't have it lock all the table, because that would take the site down. So you have to make sure you get only online operations to happen out of the data tier. And furthermore, if you're going to actually have your stored procedures work with that, you have to have them know about the new column. So you have to figure out how do you deploy a new set of stored procedures side by side so they can actually talk to the old schema and the new schema. And then you have to figure out how do you drain the requests coming from the old stored procedures to move to the new stored procedures, and then they can start using the new columns. And if you do those steps one at a time, you can actually get each of those to work with minimum downtime. The next thing you have to do is say, okay, well, if I have a billing part of my site and I have the login part of my site and I have the new account provisioning part of my site, those all can't use the same API anymore. I need to split those up a little bit. And there's one set of procedures that does one of those and another set that does another, instead of having them be one big monolith. And I might upgrade just the billing part of my site. And it might be okay that I stop running bills for a while because that's an asynchronous operation, whereas the login path is much more sensitive. So you want to pull things away from all the critical pieces that customers would see so that they rarely ever see anything that's close to downtime. But the background operations like processing new account creation might be that you can just put those in a queue and have them wait while you do the maintenance and then catch back up after you finish doing the maintenance on that part of the database. These techniques are used in regular SQL Server in the high end, but in this world, because most of these sites are cloud facing, you know, cloud services now facing the internet, a lot of them have those requirements sort of a priori. You can't build these kinds of sites without actually thinking like this. And it's great fun because once you decompose it, it's actually a lot easier to upgrade your application. You just have to think about it a little differently. It's not one big monolithic database anymore. It's often a set of databases and a set of technologies, and you have to figure out, hey, wait a minute, if I actually sharded all of this, I have to now do this across maybe a thousand databases and then make sure that they all get out before I can start upgrading the next part of my upgrade cycle. So the thing we've been building to is how do you think about understanding these, these different systems and what, do you, what does it mean? And earlier in the talk, I mentioned how there's no distributed transaction coordinator today. And this forces a very different model of programming against the server today than you would in regular SQL Server. So if I try to go build uh, something to actually you know, change 10 databases at a time, I have to think very carefully about, well, what happens if I fail halfway through committing changes to those? I may have five of my changes that are committed and four of my changes didn't get committed and one just blows up and I don't know what happened. So that's not completely out of the ordinary in this world. So you have to think from a programming perspective, well, how do I take and walk back to something that's actually useful? And I think that the, the challenge in this is you have to actually write your code to understand if it failed, how do I go recover from that or how do I roll back from that? So you're writing a little bit of that logic. In the academic circles, this is called an eventual consistency model. So if I want to make a change in two different places, I can commit it to the first one and then I can try to commit it to the second one. And if it doesn't work, I either just find the first one as being the point of, point of truth and then the later when I come back and try all this again, I recognize they're out of sync and I go actually try to change that over and over and over again until I get it to commit. Or I have to accept that I can only have the state in one place. So you have to be very careful about where do you place state in your data design in order to make that fully work. Ultimately, the customers that are more, most successful at this don't spend a bunch of time trying to get that to happen for every single part of their application. They selectively pick which parts of their app need to have this property because it's actually more expensive to build than just not thinking about it, right? And later over time, there'll be some additional help that we might put into the service to help make sure that that's more automatic. But today, the enterprising people kind of building these services, that, that's what they're doing now. The last piece I didn't mention here is it could be that because you have state in different funky positions of your service that are different, you might need to be able to ignore whenever you get state that makes no sense. 
So each component of your service might have to react to, hey, someone called me with a set of inputs that are completely garbage. They say, delete this user, and they don't exist. Well, I should just ignore that request instead of actually erroring and causing all sorts of problems later. So it could be that you actually have a site that's not entirely consistent because you don't have a single global state anymore, and it's just too big to coordinate that across a distributed system. In distributed systems programming, this is very common. In databases, it tends not to be as common because it's a very, you know, very transactional environment. So understanding when to use the transactional piece and when to switch to this distributed systems piece is how you can de deliver services in this world on top of Azure. Now, I focused a lot on how you do this in SQL Azure, but the same techniques actually apply across a number of the different technologies that we ship. So if you're going to use Service Bus or any of the other technologies that we have in Windows Azure with SQL Azure, the same techniques apply. You just have to think about what am I doing with each of those and how do I make sure my state eventually gets consistent. Okay, I'd like to wrap up now. So if you have uh, a SAS ISV and you want to be able to, to build one, you can do so on Azure, and I can make it any scale you want. The types of customers that I'm working with today have thousands of databases to tens of thousands of databases running on Azure right now. They're building huge sites. Many of them you probably have used and just don't realize it yet. Microsoft has several first-party properties doing this, and there's a couple of third parties as well. And it's sort of an interesting time because these guys are all sort of backwards from what I would consider normal, regular SQL Server scale-up application design. And I found it really interesting because uh, as a person who has to go make them all work, you, you have to sort of back up and understand what parts of what you do in regular SQL Server make sense and what parts don't make sense. And the typical parts that, that do make sense are all the details about, I want to do online index builds and I want to make sure I have a crisp schema and I want to understand what am I doing for every single operation and how do I get my sort procedures to be cleanly designed against my data tier. The parts that don't make as much sense boil down to, as soon as I want to actually make an operation that goes across uh, the whole schema uh, report or my schema gets complicated, and I need to have multiple different sets of sharded databases. How do you make that actually work? And then you have to start using the techniques that I've described here today. So with that, I'll conclude my remarks. Thank you very much for your time. I'll take questions if there's any. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, I, can you repeat that just a little louder? I didn't hear. Sorry. Uh, if you use customers with existing services that are migrating to SQL Core, do they do the sharding first on their physical SQL Server pre uh. and then get all that work in there before they go to the cloud, or what is the approach okay. happening? Great. The question is, so that everyone can hear, um, if I have a regular SQL Server on-premise thing and I want to move to this model, do I shard first? Or do I move and then shard? And it's a great question. I think it depends a little bit on the scale that you have right now. If you have an application that doesn't fit into 150 gigabytes today, you need to think about functionally partitioning and or sharding early before you move up. Um, of the services that have on-premise equivalents that have moved to the cloud, there are, there, I've, seen, I've seen both, where they sort of take their system, especially if they're this ISV pattern, um, initially that two database model where they might have a, a system database and an individual customer database, that model might actually work for a while just getting it up onto the cloud. And then they only have to shard after a bit to make sure that things grow, or if they want to go multi-tenant, starting from a single tenant design. So if I want to go multi-tenant, I can often do so to reduce my costs. One of the things I covered in the pre-con yesterday actually was uh, you'll realize that you, once you get a lot of customers, some of them are busy and some, some are not busy. And therefore, the ones that are not using your site, well, you can just sort of put them in the same database after a while so you don't have to pay for more, more databases. And that can be done incrementally. So there's no hard and fast rule, but I've seen customers that have to do either. And the way I would phrase it to you is if, if your database is just big or your load is large or you know you're going to have, you're going to port customers and there's going to be a lot of them, you probably want to think about that design before you, you move up. But most of the early ones just sort of showed up one day and started doing it. And therefore, they, they did it after the fact. Can I get one of the helpers to go give drink tokens out? Thank you. It's uh, the guy in the green shirt. Green striped shirt. It is green? Greenish. Excellent. The lights are very bright. I'm very old. <laughs> it's amazing I can even walk, actually.
Other questions? Yes, sir. A little louder, I'm sorry. Y yell. So I'm asking how, how did the uh, connection caching problem. The connection caching problem. Yeah. Okay. Do the customer need to remember the name of the database where the database is stored? Right. Okay, so the question that you were asking was about this slide that I had earlier about the directory database. And the question is uh, do you have to remember the name of the database that it was stored in? And how do you keep track of all of that? So, all right. I'll explain that a little bit more here. So. The, the typical pattern that I recommend for customers, I didn't go into all the details in the slides here, but I can post a blog post on, on what I do here. This is, uh, it, what, what customers do today is they'll have a database, and inside that database they'll have, here is the customer, it's mapped to this ID, that ID gets mapped to this database, and that database has a connection string. And you keep the connection strings in your central metadata database, and then you can use that to do the lookup. In each app tier VM, you'd be able to cache those connections and have the regular connection pooling logic know about them. If you want to get really smart, you can just keep a copy of that table in memory in each app tier VM. And uh, I would suggest that eventually, it's my goal that that become easier for you so you don't have to think about it, right? What you get in that model is that each client can directly route to the target database without ever having to touch the central metadata database. You just have to have the cache data from that. And so the techniques that you're typically using here are trying to avoid that single point of failure, partially because it's a scale bottleneck, partially because it's an availability bottleneck, but also because the maximum performance that you can get in the latency you can achieve is just lower by doing the direct connections. So if you can get that affinity, your life is good. The last piece is that if you actually want to get that pod architecture that I described where you avoid the n squared interconnect, what you end up doing is you need to have that, you need to have that partition map known up at the top above that regular load balancer. So sometimes people will put a, a web role up there that actually knows the partitioning and routes into different deployments in Windows Azure. And each one is the same deployment, it's just only handling A through C, another one's handling D through F, et cetera. So having that partitioning function known all the way up the stack allows you to do that affinity through, through the tiers and get your compute aligned with your storage. Does that answer your question? Here, why don't I just give these to you, thank you. Yes, sir. Ah. So the question is, in the future, will SQL Azure provide more options to you that gives you greater, greater availability of different choices and maybe bigger database size or maybe more throughput? And I can't talk about what's happening in the future, but I'll just say it's a very common customer request. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, this all sounds great to me. The main reason I know for people not adopting SQL Azure is to do with government things like the payment card industry. Yes. What, what's Microsoft's view of that? How's that going to progress Great. in the future? The question is about uh, compliance and government regulations. Hey, if I'm a government entity, I might have all sorts of rules about what can use a public cloud infrastructure, and how do we make sure, uh, how do we make sure that that works? Is, is Microsoft working on that? There's actually a place called the Windows Azure or the Azure Compliance or Trust Center. I don't remember the exact name, but um, there's a public site that we have that describes all the different certifications that we have so far on each of the different services inside of Azure. And uh, over time, we're working on additional ones. And if you go look at the chart, you'll see that um, some of the services have more checks than others right now as they've gotten through different parts of the government process uh, earlier or later than others. And when there's holes, you can pretty much guess some of the areas that we might be working on getting check boxes for. Uh, typically, the marketing guys don't seem to put the column in there unless we intend to be in I don't understand. It's fascinating working with marketing people. <laughs> um, so just uh, give it a try. Go look there. And the, the way that I've given guidance to people is, uh, obviously, uh, when, when I've gone out in the field and visited customers that have compliance regulations, we're going to be in the business of getting every certification you can name to make sure that that works. And sometimes, um, sometimes the cloud world is a little different than what you might expect for on-premise stuff and the rules that governments have might not fully be updated to understand the differences in the cloud world. So for example, uh, we might get a public certification and have people come audit our data center as part of that process and then give the certification to the government. 
as opposed to just letting any random entity come and audit our data centers. Because if one of the requirements is that people can't come into your data centers, you can't just have random in, you know, people going and auditing your data centers. You have to have the right people. So there's a number of things that have to get worked out here. And typically, if there's an account issue where you have a sale that's blocked because of this and you can't move forward, then please engage your Microsoft sales representative and ask them to escalate. Because there are sometimes things where the exact details can be shared under NDA that we can't talk about publicly yet and, and things like this. So we're working very heavily on this. And it's obviously, it's a big area. And I've actually spent a lot of personal time working on exactly this problem over the past six months. Yes? Does that mean that you could actually in the future ask them, because you, you say we don't know where your database is or on which machines, but could you then actually start specifying, I need my database to be physically located, say, uh, within the European Union. Could you actually ask that as part of your purchase? So yeah, the question is, do I have the ability to pick geographically where I place my data? And the answer is, you actually have that today. Um, and that's a feature of the system. So there are a number of, of uh, European requirements that say the data can't leave the EU, for example. And so we have two data centers right now in, in the EU. And you can pick either of those. And your data won't move off of that. And there's all sorts of very strict requirements. And we're actually in the middle of publishing some official guidelines about exactly which kinds of data uh, must stay within the compliance boundary, which you can think of loosely as the cluster machines that we have. And uh, then what kinds of data can we pull out of that for, say, troubleshooting purposes to make sure that we can run our service effectively? So this is actually one of the areas I, I went and I wrote all the rules for this, because I got tired of, I didn't like the rules. So I went and wrote new rules and got them all approved by the lawyers. So now we can run our service. And we can also make sure to follow all the government regulations. And it makes sense. So we have a consistent model. So yes, uh, today, just pick either of the European regions. And you have that, that guarantee already. From a regulatory standpoint, that will roll up into some certifications, which I don't believe everything has been signed off yet, so the checkbox is there. So just to be uh, sure, what I'm making is a statement about physical positioning, not certification yet, because I don't want to speak for the lawyers. Right. Yes, sir. Can you tell us the countries where the data centers are located? Uh, the countries in which the data centers are located, I believe, so in the, in the EU, I assume you're asking. Uh, yes, I, I know where they are. I'm asking myself if I'm allowed to tell you. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so they've told you. So <laughs> I didn't have to tell you. Uh, I think, I mean, there, there's one in North Europe and there's one in West Europe, which is really <laughs> Northwest Europe. Um, I don't know quite yet what we're, our official statements on that are, partially because sometimes the uh, target, the, the statement will be this region, we might add another data center that might not be in exactly the same country, uh, and there'll be two, and they might not always be in exactly the same country. The way I would phrase it is, if there's a regulatory reason for you to have it within a specific country, please engage your account managers from Microsoft so that we can talk about that. From a, a performance perspective, you can go and write a little app that pings things to see what the latency is back and forth, and you can get a sense from your network path uh, how far that is. From a regulatory standpoint, you can tell I've been working on this, right? Um, <laughs> from a regulatory standpoint, you, yeah, just talk to the account manager. That sounds, <laughs> sounds a lot easier than me worrying about it right now. But overall, uh, people know where they are. And we have, I don't think it's, it's a closed secret. But at the same time, I don't think we've been officially saying where they are because we do have plans to build more data centers. And we don't want people to be upset if you make the assertion, ah, this is in country X, and therefore, every time you create something in that region, it must be in country X, especially in Europe, where some of the countries are not necessarily geographically far from each other. Yes, sir. Would I consider the design pattern outside the cloud? Would I consider this design pattern outside the cloud? Absolutely. We have several large customers in the SQL Server who have used um, the sharding part of this pattern outside the cloud. And some of the nuances about Azure will show up. It's the red shirt at the top and the glasses. Yeah, make sure he, make sure he gets drunk. Uh, yeah, so no, we have several large customers, the very largest of customers uh, who would need to consider this because you get to the point where one machine can't, can't handle it. Yeah, so this happens already. So yeah, this is not, I didn't make this up, right? This is just the pattern. But it's not common to everyone, so I thought it'd be nice to give a talk on it. But, but yeah, absolutely. Now, the things that are different about it are, if I have a whole SQL Server instance, I can create a larger database 
right? And, and therefore, I don't need as many nodes. So I'm just scaling out my compute, typically. And I just buy a big enough I.O. subsystem to make it run. So you still get to choose the hardware, but the pattern architecturally works the same. Yes? So, so the question is, if you move just your data tier to Azure, then that doesn't work because you also want to move your app tier for latency reasons. Is that, did I get it right? Yeah. yeah. So yes, you typically would not run your data tier far away from your app tier. And uh, Microsoft wants to make it so that you can put those two together so you can get decent app application performance. The goal would be that the overall cost of your solution when you do this, uh, is an interesting thing because it's not just, okay, what's the cost of the machine and the power? It's also, what do you need to manage that? And usually when we go through and work out costs with customers, they might be thinking of their capital expenditures but not their operational expenditures. So you kind of have to think about which pieces do you keep and which pieces do you not keep to make it work. But uh, in many cases, customers have substantial savings from moving to this world compared to what they would do even for an on-premise thing. And, and I don't claim that for every single application, we have to look at it, but Typically, this is not uh, a problem for customers. They're much happier on the platform from a cost perspective. Come on, I'm going home tomorrow. <laughs> I'll answer any questions you want. Doesn't even have to be Azure if you want. Just a thing, a simple question about security. Yes. How does it work uh, with Azure? How does security work with Azure? Is it like SQL Server login password and then? Oh, I see what you're asking. So, um, so today, SQL Azure just has SQL auth, which is login passwords, and it works the same basic way. It has SSL for connections between you, your client, and uh, the, well, from the TDS client to the server, which can be regular on-premise or the app tier talking to it. And then over time, there'll be additional features that we turn on. But regular SQL Azure today doesn't have the whole surface area of SQL Server today, partially because you have to do uh, key management and stuff around, say, transparent data encryption. So over time, you should expect that the surface areas would converge as we build out the functionality to make sure that more and more certifications can be achieved. So databases are encrypted, then you can compress them also? So there's no database compression enabled in SQL Azure today either, but uh, you we're, you know, we're buying the cost of the storage. It doesn't matter to you. I mean, you, I guess you pay for the larger database size, but the cost is not a huge number per database, typically. Over time, you should expect all the features that you love would show up, but not all of them are there right now. So I would describe it as uh, people who are very motivated because they either are a startup or they can't get past their IT department buying new hardware or they just think it's cool or they can move faster, et cetera. So there's, those are the techniques that usually drive people right now. And sometimes those features aren't the first things that they're asking for. So as we build out the functionality, we think that we'll get a larger and larger set of the customers to be happy and able to handle existing on-premise deployments that move up. So if you have a requirement for those right now, you, you shouldn't necessarily move, or you can go to the SQL in a VM solution that we have, where it has the full surface area. OK. So I think we're out of time. I'll stay up here if there's any more questions. Thank you very much for coming, and please enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.